You're listening to From the Chair, and I'm your host, Mike Hamilton. Join us each episode as we talk to athletic directors from across America. We're going to talk about topics like leadership, career development, issues of the day, and I can promise you we're going to have some fun along the way, too. So sit back, listen in, and let's dive in. Let's go. All right. Great to be back for another episode. My guest today is a longtime friend and someone who is no stranger to this industry, and that's the Vice President and Intercollegi- Director of Intercollegiate Athletics at Memphis, Laird Veach. Laird, thanks for being with us today. Happy to be here, Mike. Good to, good to see you again, and thanks for having me. Yeah, absolutely. Hey, let's, uh, let's just get rolling. Um, I was thinking this morning as I was looking at my notes for our conversation and just thinking about the industry in general, there's so much going on today, right? And uh, I'm curious, you know, we're in November, so what is that, four or five months into a new fiscal year? Uh, you know, fans are back in the stands, that kind of thing. Talk to me just a little bit about what you're seeing in Memphis in terms of COVID recovery. And I don't necessarily mean the intricacies of your finances or anything like that necessarily, mm-hmm. just what you're experiencing with fan behavior and, and how that's going as we come out of what's been a crazy 18 months. Yeah, you know, I'd, I'd say it's just now really starting to feel like um, we are truly getting back to normal. I'd, I'd say we're not, you know, quite there, but uh, it, it feels much more so than – than, than it did even, you know, a month or two ago. Uh, beginning of the season, we were still kind of feel, feeling our way. Um, you know, I, I do think it's it's impacted some of our attendance. Uh, one of the one of the things that surprised me a little bit is, you know, with as, um, you know, promising and high profile and as a big a deal as men's basketball is here in Memphis, uh, you know, we, we have seen a little bit of impact on sales for, for men's basketball than what I thought we might. Um, and I think part of that has been, that uh, you know there is a, a requirement for um, either vaccine or um, you know uh, proof of test as you enter into the FedEx forum. Uh, so that's some of it, but I think there's still a little hesitancy on the part of part of some. Uh, but really, I'd say over the last handful of weeks, it's starting to shift back to uh, to, to normal normalcy. You know, uh, anecdotal to your notion about the vaccine requirement or negative test to come into the forum. Um, you know, here in Nashville. And, and by the way, just for the record, uh, this is this will be running pretty soon, but we're recording on, on November the 4th. So I, I, I say that only because of what I'm getting ready to say. We've had that requirement for Predators games in uh, the NHL team here in Nashville. And they they just changed that uh, for their next home game, which is November the 13th. But in looking back, uh, two, de- two games ago when the Preds were playing the Sharks, uh, they broke their 192-game sold-out streak for the first time and you know what is that and preds you know the nhl they play 40 something games a year so four or five years and there the notion has been that the the requirement for the vaccine or negative test enter may have perhaps affected that so i'm interested to see as they now move to this next phase where you're not required to have a vaccine anymore if the a, a new sellout streak will start right mm-hmm. so I know that's uh, that will evolve at your place like it, it will at other places around the country and there are different protocols. How, let me ask you this from a, just functionally speaking from how you guys as an athletic department, your behavior locally there uh, during the middle of the pandemic and, and now, and we've done these, these calls that we're like we're on right now, zoom calls or whatever. Do you uh-huh. see some, some permanent takeaways from the COVID environment that you feel like, okay, we learned some lessons here and, and that's probably a pretty good idea. Let's keep doing that. Yeah, I think it's probably not too dissimilar to what uh, most, most places have learned. Uh, you know, for us, it's, it's certainly been the, the digital ticketing and, you know, moving a lot of that forward quickly. Um, it, it accelerated that process for us a great deal. And that's, that's been a big benefit. Um, and I think part of it, too, uh, I would say operationally, just in terms of control and, and limiting access to, to field, the, the fields, uh, the court, um, you know, those types of areas. I think some of that will carry over more. So, so more just uh, access and availability uh, from a fan standpoint on one end, but also kind of controls, uh, operational controls around the, the uh, you know, the playing environment. Those are the two things that really stick out the most in uh, terms of things that I think will carry over. Yeah. Well, hey, look, let's let's shift to uh, another hot topic for for uh, today's world. And that's this conference realignment uh, piece that we've all been experiencing over the last several months. Um, you sit in an, in an interesting place. I mean, you're at a great school with great history. Uh, you're in a, a, a community that's got incredible corporate support. 
you've had a success nationally, particularly in basketball, and um, you know, in a city that's got some population and in a region that's got some some ability to get different places. Um, uh-huh. I know Memphis has been mentioned from time to time as maybe moving on to other leagues or whatever, but for now you're stationary in the American and you've seen, a, you know, some of your teams move to other leagues and you, then you also have acquired other teams getting ready to move into your other league, into your league. So I think you've got a, the ability to speak to this maybe in a unique way and, uh-huh. you know, a couple of that with just your long time in the industry. So I'm curious as to your thoughts on where this is today, you know, have, uh, is it mostly done now, or do you think there's more to come? Um, just, just your your thoughts from your chair. Yeah, um, you know, being at Memphis has been it has been a really interesting uh, spot to be in to sort of you know observe on one hand, but be a part of uh, these these uh, processes over the last several weeks. The um, I, I sort of look at being on uh, kind of look at us right on the edge in, in many respects, <laughs> and on, on on both sides of the. Uh, of the table, if you will. Um, so it, it creates some challenges, but also some opportunities that, uh, that other schools may not have uh, one way or the other. Um, you know, I, I do think um, it's going to continue in one way, shape or form. Uh, it, this, this sort of ra- initial round here uh, that was, you know, uh, that was generated uh, by the, by the Texas and Oklahoma move, uh, I think is starting to settle down, but you know, my, my guess is there'll be there'll be more here in the not too distant future. Um, just it's sort of the nature of things, right? I mean, that's one of the consistencies in college athletics is that conference realignment has always been here, um, and it just seems like we're at such a time of of instability and change in our in our world um, on multiple fronts uh, that. I, I would anticipate there, there will likely be more. It may not be in the next few months, but within the next few years. Uh, you know, for, for us, it's um, it has been a challenge because, you know, there is such a desire to, to elevate, right? And, and I've been very clear about that. I think everybody recognizes it and is, is comfortable with the fact that if, if we have an opportunity to improve ourselves and, and better our position, we're going to we're gonna do that. Um, I've been proud of our of our fan base and sort of how they've reacted. You know, I was really concerned uh, at first when we when we did not uh, when we were not part of that that Big Twelve expansion that how our people would react. And you know, for the most part, while they're certainly disappointed, um, our, our fans recognize that you know it, there's still hope and there's still opportunity ahead, and it's really driven a, a sort of a desire to to want us to continue to invest and do the right things. Um, and then, you know, from an American standpoint, uh, it was that was uh, it, it was it sort of it immediately flipped. So I was on the side of all, all one of the ADs that was calling all the other ADs and trying to, you know, understand what's really going on behind the scenes back there. And then, you know, literally like the week late, the next week, it flipped over, and I'm getting calls from all, you know, my old my old friends uh, uh, across the country that uh, may want to be in our league. And so it was really interesting. Um, and as you know, those those processes move very fast, right? There, that's what's sort of strange about it is we have these massive institutions that that move really quick on these big decisions. Um, but I was really pleased with with where we landed. You know, the uh, I, I pushed from the beginning the for our conference to think about getting bigger and and not just you know filling in you know a couple three that we lost, but let's let's think about expanding larger than that because I think it's important from a stability standpoint. I think it, it's important from a from a, a, a television uh, and, and value positioning standpoint in the future, not only in markets, but also in overall content. And so it just seemed like the right sort of business move to make. And we ended up, uh, I think we've ended up in a, in a really good uh, good place here and uh, we'll start the transition. You know, while the, the schools that, that exited do have, they, they're taking good markets with them, the reality is you guys, you know, you replace that plus more probably with who, you, who you're adding, right? Which is probably helpful in the long run, right? right. Um, and, you know, part of it was a is it was a play for the state of Texas because that's a, such an a, a impactful piece, um, and making sure we're we're stabilizing there. But then we went back to the 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 sort of model of the American from the beginning has been, you know, uh, bigger schools, big markets, uh, growth markets that you, you feel like there are places where they can they will continue to elevate. Um, and you want to know that there's a commitment to athletics, so that they're going to, the institutions are going to continue to invest. And, um, you know, I think all those match up, match up well. You know, hey, so, by the way, I'm getting ready to ask you a question. I didn't sort of let you know I was going to ask, but it's, it's come to me <laughs> as we're talking here. Uh, you know, as it relates to this conversation we're having right now, 
and some of the controversy around the the release of the CFP standings and that kind of thing. Do you believe that the bias towards Power Five schools, or let's call them um, traditionally successful football schools, is real? And does the expansion of the CFP mitigate that? Or what else needs to happen to make sure that that the the CFP continues to be um, you know what we all need it to be, and that's a very viable solution to determining a national champion. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, you know, I do think there is there's real bias. I think that's just sort of natural human tendency, right? And, and I and I come at it from a place. So I was at you know uh, Kansas State for several years, um, and then at a Florida, and now here. So I think I have you know I've seen it some, from several different angles. And it, it, there, there's certainly it's certainly difficult for uh, a Memphis or a Cincinnati to to break through. I mean that 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 is that is obvious based on the the way things are structured now, uh, which is one of the the big reasons why I do feel like it should expand, and not just because of uh, creates opportunities for schools like ours, but because I think it's truly healthy for for college football and and it allows uh, an interest for from more people right and that in the end that's in terms of you think about the long-term viability of if you look at, at college football as a product that we're, we're selling to fans whether that's you know from a viewership standpoint or attending games or what have you the more people in this country that are truly engaged and that are care and involved the, the better for the long-term viability of of college football so it, it needs to expand um and you know whatever model that is i mean to me the the 12 uh team seems to make the most sense um you know but uh you know that's a that's a decision that uh that is going to be made by others but i but i think it needs to be made and we need to not not drag it out yeah yeah um a couple more questions about memphis and then i want to talk a little bit about your career and some learnings from that um you know you um you play in two venues specifically in your in your uh biggest revenue driving sports that are off campus. Uh, the Liberty Bowl, uh, which I believe is getting ready to undertake a little bit of a different name, but you know, an iconic structure that's been there for a long time. Everybody knows it. Um, and then of course the FedEx Forum, home of the Grizzlies and the Memphis Tigers. Um, you know, talk a little bit about, uh, there's some goodness in that, right? As to why Memphis has been aligned with those venues. And then maybe, uh, you know, I, I know there's probably a little difficulty too. Maybe it's because of student attendance or whatever. Just curious as to your thoughts. You know, that's not, you know, given the schools that you've worked at previously, that that was a, a new thing for you to experience. So your thoughts on that? Yeah, very much. And it is truly a good and bad, right? That, that's the, that there is some, there's some real positives to it. And, you know, I think about it, you know, particularly from a, a men's basketball standpoint and being able to play in an NBA arena uh, that is, you know, situated right on Beale Street and uh, the, the quality, the size, the presentation, the experience uh, for our fan base is, is, is really high, but it also really fits with our brand and, and what, uh, uh, you know, Penny is building here with, uh, you know, basically a, a, a development for development program for NBA superstars <laughs> and, and being able to play in an NBA arena is, is is really really fits that well um and i and i think our people enjoy that uh because of the type of experience it provides and the location um you know being able to to be there uh as part of the kind of city uh look and feel uh, in beale street downtown it's just that's the the type of environment that i think really fits us um and you know on the on the football side there's real benefits as well because you know you're in a um in an area that is, you know, it's got a lot of parking, it's got a lot of space around it. They've, uh, the city has been willing to invest in some things like Tiger Lane, for those who haven't been here, our tailgate scene is pretty remarkable. It's one of the best I've really seen um, because of the setup and the space and the, and the areas around it. Um, and, you know, having another partner like the city at the table can be beneficial, right? You have you have somebody else that's willing to invest and that cares and is involved. Um, but the but the downside is it's a it's a lack of control, right? You don't you 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 don't always determine your own destiny, particularly when it comes to uh, how you uh, service your fans and the, the the type of experience you provide them on game day. You know, being a being a, 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 a old development guy that is uh, you know used to trying to really take care of people and, and 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 manage their experience, but also the operational experience I had at Florida and others, you you tend to want to be able to make sure that. You can hire the ticket taker or uh, the you know person directing traffic or you know and having having control and, and influence over all that um, is is good because you have the ability to, to make sure it, it, you hold people accountable to it. Uh, but here it's it's challenging because we just don't have that same level of, of, of control. 
So uh, there is good and bad. Uh, I, I think there's a lot of opportunity, particularly as we, we look at the Liberty Bowl. We are uh, partnering alongside the city to look at a plan on how we can invest in that and really elevate it because it has really good bones, a good structure, but it needs a facelift in a pretty dramatic way. So um, hopefully we'll be able to partner with them to, to make that happen. Well, and I know through your Memphis Rising Initiative, you're investing a ton of money in, in new uh, or renovated facilities on campus too, right? With some of your other sports. And and so um, you've got these two great facilities in football and basketball, and then now you're investing, uh, let's call it at home, right there on campus and a number of other facilities. If I recall, it's it's like soccer and baseball and maybe is it track? I, I don't know the other sports, but I know you're doing some investing on campus. Yeah, yeah. One of the one of the great things about this place that I didn't really uh, uh, recognize until I got here is that we have uh, essentially the um, footprint for a student athlete village, uh, that which is as you know is a is a trend across the country. Everybody's kind of shooting for that type of experience, and they've done a really good job prior to my arrival of investing in some key areas, particularly for football and basketball. Um, but there's some there's some uh, upkeep that needs to take place with baseball, with track soccer, with some other things. But our next big initiative is going to be um, uh, pushing forward a housing development that, you know, we will, of course, have 49 percent of uh, right there on our, our, our Park Avenue campus. Um, and then uh, right across the street from that, we're going to build a student athlete success center. So it'll house, you know, dining and academics and, and all the things that impact uh, student athletes on a regular basis, as well as our, our department staff. So we can all be there together. So it's going to create a really um, nice uh, footprint where. The, the day-to-day lives of our student athletes are all going to be in one spot, which is which is kind of the goal, right? So, um, yeah, I'm excited about that, and I think there's a, there's a yeah. ton of potential, and it's and it's stuff people really get excited about investing in because it impacts student athletes so directly. Yeah, yeah. Well, let's flip to your career for just a second. You you worked at a number of great institutions, and one of the things that is candidly a little unique for a current sitting athletic directors is your time at Learfield. I, I uh, I've just uh, my, I'm celebrating my third year anniversary at Learfield. And I know that you worked uh, for the company for seven years, I believe, seven-ish uh-huh. years, and uh-huh. serve as a GM and a, and a regional vice president uh, during a time of significant growth for the company. And um, I'm curious, because I've seen learnings myself from having been in the chair as an athletic director and now, now in the MMR business, some things, some gaps that, I, that I've seen between uh-huh. what ADs understand about the MMR business and vice versa. Uh, you, you now have had the opportunity to be in both of those places. And, and in your case, we're in the MMR business for quite some time, really. I, mm-hmm. What do you take, what do you take from that? It helps you, you know, I know you've got all the development experience as well, by the way, but, but I want to focus in just for a minute on the MMR piece of your background. What, what has been helpful in coming through that particular point in your career to what you're doing today or informative to your career today? Yeah, you know, I've I've uh, told uh, many folks that you know, for for me, I think that's uh, one of the sort of unique advantages, and it, and it's more of an advantage than I ever had anticipated. You know, I took the job thinking going to Learfield, thinking that that was going to be my career path. Right, it wasn't about trying to lead to the, to this to this position. It was I, I really liked and respected the, the the leadership of the company. I liked the idea of uh, of really focusing on the the, the business of sports. Um, and, you know, just being in the in the corporate environment, but you'll still having kind of a one foot in the the, in the athletic scene as well, uh, the, the college athletic scene. Um, so it's been it's been a really uh, it was really a healthy experience for me. And it really comes down to perspective. Right. It allowed me to see things from, you know, not only just directly the MMR piece, but a more of a of a global scale uh, within college athletics. And, and as you know, and I might would, in, in your role, you end up touching a lot of different schools and you see things um, with, it, it's kind of, you know, like thin slicing. You just kind of get a, a view of their department, but you get a pretty pretty interesting perspective of it. And, and had seeing several schools like that has been, been really helpful. Um, and, and also just being able to see it from, uh, from a business perspective and, and managing, um, you know, a true kind of bottom line oriented, uh, organization, you, you have to, um, you have a different perspective than what you traditionally do in, in an athletic department. Um, so that's been really helpful, but it also has given me some direct perspective on how, you know, media partners really look at things, um, and, and, you know, I, as, I, as I remember being in, in your type of chair, and I would always challenge um, the folks in this chair to think about 
um, you know, Learfield and that property as if as if you were managing yourself and what decision would you make? So if it was in house, what would it look like in terms of this decision or that decision? Uh, so it allows me to kind of really see that. Um, and it also I think it allows me to, to, to look at things from from your perspective and and, uh, you know, try to be a try to be a good partner because I know what, what you really need. Um, yeah, so yeah. It's, been, it's been really healthy, and I, I I look back and I'm very thankful for that um, for that uh, that experience. You know, one of the things I've tried to help our internal team um, see is just an athletic director has so many different constituent groups that you're having to sort of manage, and mm-hmm. and those constituent groups so many times are not in alignment, and the politics involved in that are very complicated. And I think sometimes on our MMR side of things, we don't necessarily see that or understand it at the greatest level Uh, you know Mm -hmm. and the counter to that is from an ad chair i think um we've made it really comfortable over time that you know the historical precedent has been guaranteed rights fee checks and so you know a lot of times ad's have just have have accepted the check without diving in deeper to say you know what does this all mean and how can we be more informative to the process more engaged in the process because in most schools larry as you know this it's a I don't know, seven to 10 to 15 percent of line item of your revenue at, at many places. And uh, we need to do a better job on the MMR front of helping athletic directors, um, you know, keep them informed, but also pulling them into the process to understand if we unlock these certain things, then we can push your revenue to a different level and we can also expand your brand in the marketplace a, a, in a different way. So, uh, you know, you and I, you and I have got more that we ought to talk about at some point on that front for sure. <laughs> I'm sure there's a lot. Yeah. 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 Um, hey, so you played for Bill Snyder and uh, you mentioned being at Kansas state. You're, you're a Manhattan, Kansas native. You were a two time all Amer- academic all American at, at Kansas state. I think a four time big eight academic uh, winner. And you were there in what I would still call the, the early success years of, of the Bill Snyder regime. Right. But you grew up in the town. So you really saw the evolution of Kansas State football. And for a lot of folks who are, let's call uh, them uh, youngsters today, may not understand. I remember at one time, uh, you know, K-State and, and you know, Wake, I mean, they were they were struggling in terms of where they were and, and win percentage, historically speaking. Now, uh-huh. let's give credit to Kansas State for what's what's been accomplished over the last 20 plus years. And much of that goes to Bill Snyder and the support that he had around him and the players that played for him, like yourself. Mm-hmm. I'm first curious uh, as to your take on your view of seeing the evolution of Kansas State football at living there, but more specifically, what it meant to play for Bill Snyder. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it was, you know, I was I was very blessed. You know, so, so many things in life are about, you know, timing and opportunity. And, uh, you know, when, when uh, he – so Coach Snyder got there in 89. Uh, so I was part of the first kind of true recruiting class. He had a small recruiting class before he got there in 89, but it was, you know, he was only there for a couple, three months before it all hit. Um, so, it, you know, at that point in 89, he was 1-10. Um, and so we didn't really know what we were getting. Right. So I kind of jumped in with, you know, Kirby Hoka and, and, and many others that really didn't know fully what we were what we were jumping into. Uh, so it was a, uh, a remarkable experience from a timing standpoint to be, you know, to grow up there, be a local kid and, and be a part of that that transition. Um, you know, but people always ask me, so what was it like to play for Bill Schneider and, and what? What did you do to uh, to make? What did y'all do to make that happen? And and I tell people it was really really hard. <laughs> it was a lot of work, and it was a it was at a it was at a different era, right? It, you know, coach Snyder's a, an old school coach, very discipline oriented, very much outwork uh, everybody. It was before um, you know the 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 uh, the twenty hour rule and all the the limits we got now. So um, it was it was challenging, uh, but it was also extremely rewarding. And, you know, to, to be able to to be a part of a transition of a culture like that, that was really, really poor and in a lot of respects um, to uh, one that, just, you know, expected excellence and, and really, you know, uh, expected to improve every day. Right. That that type of mindset shift was um, was dramatic and, and 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 learned a lot from from that in terms of kind of life lessons on, you know, how to manage people, how to how to, um, you know, uh, you know, continue to just just get up every day and get after it. Um, it was a very rewarding experience in, in a lot of respects. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah. Well, hey, so, you know, um, when when uh, I know you worked with John Curry for a long time and uh, we both share, a, you know, a, a friendship with, with John. And uh, when John left, uh, you were deputy AD and then named interim AD. And as, as fate would have it, you didn't end up getting the AD job. And, you know, I believe there's plans for everybody's life and your your plan has played out and you're the athletic director <laughs> of Memphis and you've got a great gig and it's going well. But, you know, one of the things that I've I, as I've done these podcasts, I've I just ironically, I've talked to now a few folks who have had and held interim AD titles. And in, in many cases, uh, you don't get the job. Sometimes you do get the job. Um, but in your situation there, particularly having gone to school there and had the success you had from a football perspective, what would you say the learning lessons were for you as a part of that process that have now made you into, you know, or have informed who you are today, not only maybe as a person, not as an AD, but as a person. Mm -hmm. You know, um, and I think when you, the, the, the lessons in life for the, the hardest lessons are the best lessons in, in many respects, you know, you, you build up uh, a scar tissue and an ability to manage things that you wouldn't be able to otherwise, if you didn't, didn't go through those. Uh, but it was challenging. I, I've, I've shared with many people that that was uh, one of the most uh, emotional and difficult things to go through because, because I wanted it so bad. Right. Um, but, you know, as, as you and I both uh, know, Mike, we both share, uh, share faith and, and, and having having faith in that process was um, was critical. And frankly, I don't know how, how you go through and maintain perspective uh, on on something like that with uh, without it. Um, and I will tell you, I immediately when that did not happen, uh, I immediately knew that there was another path for me. Like you said, there's a plan and, and God had a plan. Um, and that door quickly opened. Uh, thankfully, uh, maybe I think it was even the next week, Scott Strickland called me and uh, asked me if I'd be interested in coming down to Florida. And, and that, that suddenly sounded pretty cool <laughs> to, to go to a Florida and work with Scott and, 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 the, and the great people there. So um, it was it was hard. Uh, but but I did learn that um, you really can't you can't put uh, so much of your um, identity and um, a sense of success and just getting a, or keeping a job, right? It has to be about more than that. And uh, that's where I found uh, sort of after the fact through, through perspective that, um, you know, one of the things I think I, one of the reasons I did not get that potentially is because I wanted it so much and I wanted it so much for me. Right. Um, and, and it's okay to want a job because you want that position and you want, you know, the rewards of that job and the compensation or the, the fun parts about those positions. But it also has to be something more than that. And it has to be a place like one of the things I love about this place is it's, it's something that I think I can really have an impact on. Right. I can really help um, help here. And, and the things that I've learned and the and the experiences I've had over the years can can be applied here in a way that will will impact it. Um, so it's become it's become uh, become something greater than me, which I, I think it needs to be in order to to really have uh, have an impact and and to you know the long term to be able to you know look back and feel like you 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 left a legacy and you you've done something something greater than yourself. Mm, that's great. Hey, well, so um, we'll end on a couple of other just a, a personal note and then a, and a fun question. But um, you and I share something else in common. that We're both adoptive dads. And um, I know you and Brandy have four children. I, if I recall, it's three daughters and a son. And uh -huh. uh, is it just, is it your son that's adopted or are more of your children yeah. adopted? Your son. It's, our, it's yeah. our son. Yeah. Yeah. So all five of mine are adopted, which you may you may know. And uh -huh. uh, just uh you know, he's your youngest, if I recall. So Correct. the decision, the decision for you guys to adopt, I'm just curious uh, if you'd share a little bit of that for a couple minutes. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I, I appreciate you asking. Um, you know, first of all, I will say it's it, that uh, adopting Drew and going through that process um, and the impact he's had on our family and our life has been one of the most rewarding things we've, we've uh, had the, you know, being blessed to, to be a part of. Um, so, you know, for us, it was, uh, it was kind of a, a lifelong journey in some respects. So, so Brandy is a social worker by, by trade. Um, and when we first, uh, were married and, uh, back at Mizzou with, uh, with Ross Bjork and Mario Mocha and, and that, that whole, uh, uh, crew back then, um, you know, we, we tried to get pregnant and just struggled for a while. And so Brandy being a social worker, we decided to go ahead to foster or to get licensed to foster to adopt and, 
right when we got licensed, so we went through the whole process, uh, we got pregnant. And then, of course, we, we moved not too long after. We got pregnant again and moved, and, and life sort of started happening, right? Um, so uh, fast forward then to our time at, at when we were back at Kansas State, and we were, you know, we kind of felt like we were settled. We had grandparents there in town. Our, our daughters were all uh, getting a little older. I think our youngest daughter at the time was seven, um, and we just felt called to, to do it again. It just felt right. It was something that we never really um, could, uh, could, could let go of fully. It was always sort of in the back of our minds, and we talk about it periodically, um, and it really just became clear it was the, the right time to do it. So we went through the process, and as you know, uh, much better than me doing it five times. The process can be challenging, right? Um, uh, but it is a it is a journey of faith, and and um, in the end, uh, it's it's been so rewarding not only for Brandy and I, um, and just you know the love of Drew and having him in our lives, but also for our girls. I mean, it's having having him in their lives and sort of realizing that that love and family can go beyond the, the biological connection, and, and seeing that so firsthand is is I think uh, incredibly rewarding. Um, so it's been a been a great process. It was not just because I had to have a boy. It, <laughs> that was that was gonna be part of it. I, I will admit it. I, we were gonna get a boy if we we're gonna adopt at that point. But um, but uh, it was it was for a lot of reasons, and it's it's proven out to be you know one of the best things we've ever done. So. Yeah, no doubt, man. Well, it's funny. I, I I caught the phrase you said about you know seeming like life was happening and things were you know moving right along, and in our case that's that's the place in time where we went from two to five you know i actually we adopted our last three as a biological sibling group so wow i can i completely uh, resonate with with uh your story and we'll look forward to connecting more on that as well so look i can't talk about memphis without talking about memphis barbecue right so uh <laughs> people from all over people from all over the country travel through memphis they're going to come there and play you uh, from time to time, they're going to be a participant in the Liberty Bowl. And, and you know, there's a lot of um, uh, chatter about Memphis barbecue and how it compares to other states' barbecue, et cetera, et cetera. What's the best barbecue in Memphis? And so I'm coming to you. I've got my own personal opinions, but I'm coming mm -hmm. to you for the 411, the down low on, hey, look, <laughs> you're in, the, you're, you're there. I'm sure you're eating barbecue, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. What do we need to know about barbecue in Memphis, and where is the place that you must go if you come to Memphis for barbecue? Man, it um, you know it, you've been in this in this chair, uh, Mike, so you know you learn to be a little bit of a politician too in, the, in the, <laughs> these types of questions. Uh, it's funny, when I first when I first got the job, you know, people knew about my uh, you know Kansas or Kansas City background, right? So that was one of the first questions: What's better, barbecue, Memphis barbecue or Kansas City barbecue? So. I learned really quickly to, you know, kind of avoid those those type of circumstances, <laughs> and uh, especially when it comes to barbecue in this city, we've got a lot of good partners, right? Rendezvous is really good to us. Uh, Central Barbecue is really good to us. Uh, Corky's is a good sponsor. So I'm not going to pick one. Uh, you know, I'm not going to pick between my children here, but um, but there it, it is remarkably good. And I will admit that I think it's better than Kansas City now. Now that I've been here, I feel like I can finally finally do that. Um, I really, you know, it, it's part of the culture of this place. Um, I tell you, I live out in, in Germantown. I love Germantown Commissary. is also a really, really good one. So there's a, there's a ton of them, and and they there is, but they're all a little bit unique, a little different, which I think is, is kind of what makes it fun. Um, and they are different kind of experiences, you know. But it's uh, it is definitely part of the uh, culture of this, the 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 culture of this city. So it's uh, makes yeah. it fun. You know, the thing that I think I became a fan of by coming there through the years was, uh, you know, dry rub ribs, right? That's something that Memphis becomes known for. And, of course, I partook of that at the rendezvous primarily. Mm -hmm. But uh, iconic barbecue uh, uh, places in your town. In fact, for folks who are looking for something to do in the spring that's kind of neat, Memphis in May is actually a great festival down on the Mississippi River where you can sample a lot of different kinds of barbecues. So that's my public service announcement for the, you know, the travel segment, the travel segment of the podcast. How about that? Yeah, absolutely. It is, it is a fun yeah. city. That, that is what, yeah. you know, you, when you come here, you've not spent much time. The, the, the people here like to like to enjoy each other. They're very social. Um, food is a real thing, not just barbecue, but there's a lot of really good restaurants here. It's just a very engaged, active community. It makes it makes it fun. Um, so I, I, I have enjoyed it and would encourage others to do the same. So. No doubt. Well, hey, look, Larry, it's been great to, to visit with you. The time has flown by. I appreciate you taking the time. Uh, admire greatly 
who you are as a person and the work you've done professionally and uh, and look forward to continuing to watch the success in your career. So so thanks for joining us. Okay. Happy to do it, Mike. Thanks for having me. So you've been listening to From the Chair. Today's episode has been with Laird Beach from the University of Memphis. I'm Mike Hamilton. Please go to wherever you download your podcast and subscribe, or you can also listen and, and view the podcast on YouTube each week. We release on Wednesdays. Uh, we hope you will subscribe and please send us your questions or your suggestions for guests as you get the time, the time and the chance to do that. We'll see you next time.